that um, does things all over. She can do virtual work. Um, she is awesome and does a lot for functional medicine, which is kind of our avenue of health here too. So um, I'm going to let her just explain exactly what she does in practice and then what we're going to chat about today, which is mindful eating, which is something I know that's been kind of a almost like a topic of request because everyone is like going through weird eating habits at the moment because of what's going on. Okay, so Gretchen, go ahead and introduce what you do, your background, all of that. Great. Thank you so much for having me today. So uh, my name is Gretchen Spetz and I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist. And uh, one of the things I do is I, I focus on a functional nutrition approach. So what that means is getting at the diet and lifestyle related root causes of chronic disease or just the root causes of just not feeling your best. So what I do when I meet with somebody is our initial consult. We meet for about 75 minutes and we spend a lot of time talking about your health history and you, your stress levels, your relationships. And then I'm always joking and I say, oh, yeah, we are going to talk about what you eat. Mm -hmm. So talk about what you eat, of course, because that's so important. And then we make a very specific plan to you. I'm all about a very personalized and individualistic approach. So um, we usually do a kind of a food is medicine, nutrition therapy, jumpstart to make sure that we're doing whatever is needed to support what you need to get into a better health state. And then I never leave you hanging. We always focus on creating a, sustain, a sustainable diet for you that's going to be something you can continue on in the future. So I'm all about sustainability. And you know, I, I discovered functional nutrition. I was I was trained in a very, and most dietitians are trained in a very conventional way. And I discovered functional nutrition after I had my own issues with gut problems associated with being a new mom and having a lot of stress and just not really understanding how to manage it all. And functional functional medicine is such a great approach when it comes to dealing with things like that. I love that. And that's something that we see all the time. And I know that something that you and I have chatted about is people think like the IBS is just thrown around and people think that IBS is normal or that that's just like them. And that's kind of their sentence forever. And what is your opinion on that? Like, you know, or like people that just say like, my, I'm always nauseous or my stomach always hurts, or, you know, I always have a headache. Like, obviously we know that's not normal, but like what, how do you approach that? And then where, because you, you do the whole body, not just what you're ingesting every day. What's your approach on that? Like how people, when people come to you and say like, Oh, I was told I had an IBS and that's that. Yeah. And this happens all the time. And, and I would say the number one patient population, if you will, the people that I work with are, are people that do have IBS, mm -hmm. um, whether it's diarrhea, constipation being their main symptom or a combination of both. And Really, we, when we sit down for that 75 minute initial session, we spend so much time talking about all the roots on the functional medicine tree, which I think is such an important tool. And nutrition and hydration are one of the roots, and arguably, you know, I'm biased, but one of the most important roots. But there's seven other roots that are so important. And I do talk about that. We talk about stress levels, we talk about um, potential toxin exposure. What sort of makeup products are you using? What's going on there? Um, and we also talk a lot about like, hey, you know, you're having these symptoms. You're having acne. Have you ever changed your diet, gone on a, a dairy-free diet, for instance? Because this could be an indicator that your body just doesn't tolerate dairy proteins. Mm -hmm. So then we make a plan specific to the individual person and their symptoms to eliminate foods that could possibly be triggers and to accentuate foods that will help heal the gut. So IBS, absolutely, people can recover from that. And it's all about learning what are the food sensitivity um, triggers for them. And then also managing the external things that may make this worse. So one of the things I love about, you know, working with people like you guys is the ability to refer out to chiropractor, to um, therapists, to other healthcare practitioners who can work on the other routes. And I love that, when I do that our office, we do the physical, chemical, emotional side of things, but I love this because what we do and something that is definitely um, 
a tricky part for us is we do all the we'll test, you know, somebody comes in and says I have IBS and we'll be like, all right, we need to either do, you know, a stool, a lovely stool test, um, or a salivary test or, um, a nutrient evaluation or, um, like a SIBO test, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and send them out for a breath test and things like that. And then we get the, um, you know, kind of, we get the information back, the diagnosis per se, and then we're able to say, okay, here's what you have. Now Gretchen would come in and then say, okay, here's what to do eating wise. Um, and that's something that is a huge bridge. And I think that's key to that. People always, I don't want to say miss this, but people miss the, the emotional connection with food or the ties with food and being very thoughtful about it and saying, okay, you know, it's not just about what you can't eat. Um, like you were saying, like, it's okay. Adding in things that you can and don't forget about the healthy things. And it's not an end all be all. Um, and it's also okay to be, you know, scared or have these like old habits and things like that. And it's a huge, huge bridge. And that is something too, that, like I said in the beginning, this kind of mindful, this emotional side of food or this psychological component is missing a lot of times. Um, and I think that's brilliant too that you tied that in. So with that too, what are your tips right now? Like what's your what's your thoughts on everyone, you know, with this weird time of eating and what can people do? Absolutely. And and first before we even talk about that, I just want to say changing your diet is super intimidating. Yeah. So I don't care what what's going on in the world. When you yeah. think about changing your diet, I know for a lot of people it's very, very scary. Yeah. And that's one of the great things about working with a dietitian nutritionist is it's tailored to you. So if you have a strange schedule um, or you have certain food preferences or you tell me that you're a picky eater, that's cool. We absolutely work around all of those things. So you don't have to change to conform to a diet. We create a diet that conforms to you. I love that. Because so many people here, like, um, let's use the typical, they have to go gluten-free. And it's like, oh, my God, panic. But it's like, okay, that's not, people, they think it's, like, literally the end of the world. But then you can probably offer a million other suggestions for them that makes it not that hard. Exactly. I'm always saying there's more tools in the toolbox. Let's start with this tool. And if it doesn't work, you call me, you text me, we, we immediately switch to another tool. There's so many tools when it comes to food, nutrition, cooking. And that's something that makes it really exciting. And fun. Yeah. And I know you and I like nerd out over this stuff. We love it. And some people are like, oh my God, I roll. Like I don't want to focus. I don't want to have to think about what I eat every day. But the more I was just actually talking to my fiance about this, who's like the least sciencey person on this earth. But we were talking about um, just like illness and stuff and everything going on with the, the pandemic and everything. And then um, we somehow well, we were talking about how the, the high risk people are um, people with chronic lung conditions. So let's just like start with that. And then I I, of course, spun it and I and he was saying, well, you think, you know, people that are chronic smokers, of course, it's a horrible, it's so tough to break that habit of, you know, smoking and it's tough. It's really hard for people, but, you know, in the back of their mind, most smokers know, you know, ah, oh, this is bad. It is going to put me at risk for diseases and stuff as hard as it is to quit because of um, the addictive component. But it's the same thing with food where, where we come in and look at food. We see people all the time who are addicted to food or, they know that it's probably going to give them diabetes or chronic disease. And we all know that, you know, eating fast food is not good for you or things like that. That's like the extreme, but it's that mindset switch. And that's where we come in and say, we kind of retrain the brain. We're not meant to scare you and say like, you could never have a French fry again. Of course not. I have French fries. You know, it's, it's just knowing once you can start to approach it differently and knowing that it deep down is really good for your health, food will literally start to taste different and be like, wow, I actually am enjoying this salad because I know that it's going to make me feel good. Absolutely. And um, I love French fries too, basically mm -hmm. any fried potato product. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where, this is where that mindful eating approach is so powerful because it's helping you build again sustainable, healthy eating habits by kind of redirecting how you think about food. Mm -hmm. 
So I feel like when, when we, a lot of times when people think about going on a diet, they think about reducing and cutting out in a certain number of calories and all of a sudden our food becomes a math problem and it becomes, it becomes a, a source of, of uh, limit, like a limiting source in their lives. And that's never a sustainable approach. You know, we work so much better when we're dealing with something where we have abundance and happiness. Right. So when I'm talking about mindful eating, and developing more of a mindful eating approach, there's kind of five points I like to think about. And, and there were several of the things that you said. Number one is just becoming more aware of what nutritious foods do for your body. They do more than provide you with caloric value. They give you so many things to help you stay healthy, as we know. Mm -hmm. So just kind of having that in the back of your mind, like food is my fuel and I want high grade fuel and not low grade fuel is a great way to think about it. Secondly, um, selecting nutritious foods, super important, but selecting nutritious foods that you like. It's okay if you don't like kale. <laughs> yeah. No big deal. Like it's fine. It's fine if you don't like Brussels sprouts. You don't like broccoli. Cool. I mean, I can't tell you how many patients I've had in my office who stand, who sit across from me and say, I don't like any vegetables. And there has never been one where we haven't found at least three vegetables. That they awesome. So it can be done. It can be done. And it's totally fine to honor those food preferences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that because that, that is so true as people. I hear that too sometimes. And like, of course, I'm like, what? How do you not like vegetables? But then I think people don't know how to prepare them or they don't know that, you know, it's just a totally, it's just, again, new approach. Yep. And so many tools to make them taste good. Yeah. I also like to talk a lot about trusting your body and listening to your body. So by the time we hit age five, the research shows that we are eating based upon conditioning and what our parents are eating and when they're eating and our brothers and sisters and our friends and our school and our daycare and what the TV is saying and what you see in books, magazines, any sort of media. And we're not, we're learning how to not listen to our bodies. Mm -hmm. And our body is the only place that has the formula that tells us exactly how many calories we need. There's no other formula out there that's going to give you an exact amount. So kind of retraining how to listen to your hunger signals, retraining how to honor, hey, I think I need a snack. Hey, I, I feel like I need some protein, whatever, you know, you may be feeling. Learning to honor those feelings and act upon them is a great way to get back in touch with your body. I love that, too, because I know um, this is something I actually was just talking with someone yesterday about is that any like we have said, and I know we know this, if ask any um, trained functional nutritionist or any functional medicine doc, they know that it's not one size fits all. And so my biggest pet peeve is when people say like, oh, I did intermittent fasting and it worked great for me. You have to do it. Well, that might not work well for some people and that's okay. Don't be mad at yourself, you know, because you can't do what someone else did to make them be healthy. Like that's the point of being individual. So just yes. because someone, it doesn't, you know, it gets like a fad on Instagram and everyone's doing it. It's like, it might not work and that's okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can't, I can't agree with that more. And, and that's, you know, one of the things, one of the benefits of working with a dietitian nutritionist is having somebody to guide you. Cause it can be scary trusting your body when you're hearing people saying contrary things, or you're just bombarded with information. You don't know what to do with it. Having somebody kind of lead you back to trusting your instincts or point out, oh, hey, you're feeling this way. You're feeling like you're craving sugar all the time. Well, let's look at what's missing in the diet. Mm -hmm. because that could be a huge issue for, for what's influencing your sugar cravings. Yeah. Exactly. So just like having somebody to guide you back into listening to your, your own body, because it can be hard when you've gone 30, 40, 50 years without paying attention. Yeah. And not really never knowing about the nutritious value of something or a, a calorie or anything. Absolutely. And then my favorite thing about the mindful eating approach is, and I think this is the cornerstone of mindful eating, having a non-judgmental approach to what you eat. So being mindful, recognizing when you eat, paying attention to when you eat. But guess what? If you have a treat, or even if you overindulge, because we're all going to do it, mm -hmm. it's okay. No, don't beat yourself up over it because it's the beating yourself up and the shame 
that's going to cause you to do it again and again and again. Yeah. So if you can look past the shame and acknowledge maybe why you overeat, whether it's emotional, emotional related, or maybe you missed a meal and you were super hungry, and just be able to next time that happens, because that will happen again, you know, deal with your emotions in a different manner, or make sure you're eating at specific times when you know you need to be eating, being more aware of that. That's, that's why these things happen. And we can take these moments as learning tools, not opportunities to beat ourselves up. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely key. And I think they're like just talking to your body and being nice is so important too. And I love that because I think that's been a big thing for people. It's like they've been like, I don't know why I'm eating so much sugar over these last couple of weeks. And it's like, well, duh, we're all like really stressed out and Absolutely. just acknowledge that and then process that rather than eating a cookie or things like that. Absolutely. I was just, I was having a conversation with somebody and they were talking about, oh, it's so important to eat healthy during this time and antioxidants. Totally agree with that. But I think what's even more important is making sure that we're lowering our stress levels and lowering our stress levels when it comes to eating is not beating ourselves up when we have a little ice cream. In yeah. But it's yeah. being aware of it. And if we cannot beat ourselves up, guess what? The behavior won't happen again. And we'll appreciate when we have the ice cream. Yeah, you know, like, wow, I, I can enjoy this and not be mad. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, we can lower our stress levels by just appreciating that we do still have the opportunity to have some comfort foods and then enjoying that comfort food and then being mindful about what we have the next day. We're all going to be just fine. And lower <laughs> stress levels equals better immune system. Yeah, yeah, that's the cornerstone of that for sure. I love that. And those are tools too that I think people, they, you like, you know about, and then you forget, and then you like re, you know, it's like you just have to remember. And I think a big thing that I even forget to do, I'm super notorious for this, and I've tried to get better, is um, eating, you know, with this in my hand too, my phone, you know, or like watching, reading something else. And that's okay. But I think a big thing now is like, just sit down for a minute, enjoy what you're eating, and then you'll actually remember what you ate. Like last night, I had this awesome salmon and vegetables, and I was so, I was like on, I forget what I was talking about, and I like literally didn't even realize I was eating, and then it was done. And I'm like, what am I doing? So it's just slowing down, remembering that this is food, it's nourishment, just the same as people nourish their their skin, they work out, you know, they take care of each other with like sympathy and words and hugging. Food is nourishment, and it's comfort, and it should be healthy. I think absolutely. That's and there's so many good studies out about there. You made a great point. And I, I'm always encouraging people, you know, try and take at least 15 minutes, ideally 20 minutes, but that's a long time. Yeah. At least take uh, 15 minutes to eat a meal. And you can do that by really fully chewing your food, mm -hmm. sitting down, like you said, whether you're by yourself or you're, you're with others, um, engaging in conversation if you have the ability, even if it's you know times like these over Zoom. So I know a lot of people are doing like Zoom dinner parties. It's yeah, fun. it's fun. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, making sure you're eating something tasty. But the actual act, there's a really good study that came out last year about I think it was last year, two years ago, about how if you take the time to actually smell your food, that is going to trigger your digestive system to make the enzymes and the hydrochloric acid, the stomach acid that's required to break down your food better. So if you're actually taking the time to slowly eat, you will, you will feel more full and you'll digest your food better. Love that. I think that I don't know if smelling it because I'm just usually too busy just like eating it quickly. So that's amazing to know. So that's even a takeaway that I hope some people have with this is just smell take the time literally like how often do we actually take the time to smell things not that, yeah. not that much smell um, that food it's good yeah oh i love that these are all awesome i love all of these tips and um before we wrap up here what are i know you're offering something awesome and i'm going to link it on here so people can read it and stuff um for people right now there's some tools that you're gonna offer them absolutely so one of the first steps when it comes to kind of figuring out what, what am I doing with my food is having some good recipes in your arsenal. And I find that a lot of people are just kind of burnt out on meal planning and searching Pinterest and finding things that don't require expensive ingredients and are in their cooking skill wheelhouse and are using 
quality foods. And, and again, searching, Googling, all those things can be time consuming and, and really annoying. So um, one of the things, tools that I do offer is meal planning. So you have the opportunity to have a free five day um, meal planning uh, program at your disposal and you get it for five days. After five days, if you still like it, great, you can sign up and it's uh, $20 a month for the custom planner. Um, but the thing I love about this and I searched long and hard for a, an interactive program that would do this. Um, my, my meal planner allows you to customize your meals. So you can look through the catalog of recipes and pick and choose what you want for various days. It's utilizing whole foods, simple ingredients, and simple directions. You don't have time to be in the kitchen for a long time. These are tasty meals that don't take a long time to make. And then last but not least, you can actually pick what kind of, of diet plan you're searching for. So if you're looking for something that's more anti-inflammatory, that's awesome. That's on my, my website. If you're looking for something that's suitable for um, managing blood sugars or diabetes, there's a low glycemic plan that's excellent. And there are several others for different um, conditions or desires as well. I love that. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And then a lot of people I find, you know, have never met with a dietitian nutritionist. And um, I often get people walk in my office, especially when I worked in the hospitals, and they would say, oh, I was so scared about this appointment. I, you know, you're gonna be the food police. You're gonna tell me what I can never eat again. And that's just not how I work at all. So I offer um, complimentary 15 minute discovery calls to kind of learn a little bit more about you and your nutrition goals. And then you can learn a little bit more about me and my approach. And we can see if we're a match. Um, if we're not a match, that's cool. You learn something new. And oftentimes, if it's not something I provide that you're looking for, I can refer you to another practitioner. I love that. People do need to feel like comfortable and excited. And I know they will with you because it's a very awesome approach and you're an awesome person. But it's kind of feeling it out. Like, is this for me? Am I ready to do these things? And that's where you can come in and guide them with you about this dr melissa i loved it and like i say i'm gonna link everything so people can contact you if they um have questions thank you so much again i even love talking about this now i'm gonna go make sure i smell my lunch before i actually eat it oh and i just looked out the window and it's snowing again in cleveland oh. <laughs> i just looked out like oh my goodness but thank you so much again and i love this and i will chat with you soon Thank you so much, Dr. Melissa, and have a wonderful day. Thanks for letting me talk about mindful eating. Yes, loved it. Thank you. Bye. Bye.